You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their inventory of classic vehicles and follow them on Instagram at Commonwealth underscore classics. Thank you, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, podcast number 95 for February 2021. This is the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by Ford about Land Rover owners. I'm your host, John Costage. Joining me over Zoom, Harold and Morgan. Welcome, gentlemen. Hey. Hey. Dixon is uh, not available this month, so hopefully he's not trying to cross the border illegally to get to his truck. <laughs> Oh, I think he's busy keeping the Crown's networks running. Our guest this month is Alec Bro. Alec is a member of the Gulf Coast Land Rover Club, and he's organizing the Pensa Rover Rally for April 24th. Alec also bought a new Defender five months ago, and he'll tell us about the 12,000 miles that he's put on the tires. Yeah, he, he might actually have an opinion or two about that Defender. Yeah, 12,000 miles in five months. As always, thanks for your comments, follows, and likes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. The podcast is available on YouTube under the account Center Steer Podcast. And be sure to subscribe through whatever means you listen to the podcast to have it automatically delivered when it is posted. If you have been following Oxford, enjoying our interviews with figures in the Overland and Land Rover community, and liking our coverage of most things Land Rover, please consider supporting the show. You can be a regular podcast supporter through Patreon, be a one-time supporter through Buy Me a Tea, or show off your support by purchasing a sticker or a t-shirt. Visit our website, www.centersteer.com, that's C-E-N-T-R-E, for all the details. And a special shout out to Bob for his generous buy me a brown water support. <laughs> Every time uh, Bob sends us a, a buy me a tea, he always says, here's another one for some brown water for the crew. Just really don't want to know where that brown water is coming from. I remind you that we have a voicemail feature on the website. You can record your comment or question and enter your name and email and send it on in. There's a giant red button on the website. Before we get to the news, I had a nice uh, little expedition this past weekend. Just wanted to get out you know, we're in wherever day 5 million of the pandemic and it's what a year in now. Good friend Dana, who has an Xterra, one of the first people I ever actually off-roaded with uh, when I had the Freelander. And, and likes to let us know every chance he gets how much better the Xterra is than the Land Rovers. Because he never gets it stuck. Especially with those tires, 35 inches. And uh, although, Harold, uh, I think this might be the last year for the Xterra. Well, he's, it's becoming a series truck. He's been trying to make it into a series truck for a decade now. Now, he did the whole leaf springs and solid axle. Now he's adding all the rust that comes with a series truck. It's time for a galvanized chassis, Dana. So we went up to Chest. I think it's Chestnut Ridge, right past, uh, uh, right off of Route 30, Lynn Run State Park. And yeah, yeah, that's Chestnut Ridge. Chestnut Ridge. And uh, I think, is that or part no, of that's, no, that's Actually, no, that's Laurel Ridge. It's Laurel Ridge. Thank you. You're right. It is Laurel Ridge. Chestnut's between Latrobe and Ligonier. It's also near a kind of a ski area, a state ski area. I think it's part of the Forbes Forest also. You know, we've been up there a number of times. End of winter, wanted to get out and take a drive. And it turned out, it was so beautiful. Snow is there, it was all on the ground. This is one of the higher points in the area. It's like 2,500 feet up. There was, I'd say about a foot of snow on the ground. It probably was actually more, but there was also the trees were bent over a bit because they had melted and frozen and melted and frozen. And they were heavy with, uh, you know, with heavy wet snow and everything was covered you know, on the, you know, the bark was covered. The, the trees yeah, were they covered. Were, they were looking like the crystalline entity from Star Trek. It, absolutely. They plow up to a certain point and then the Roads are, they're plowed, but just, there's still a pack of snow under, under that. So you have basically like a, a white road and everything is white far as you can see. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And we, just, we drove through there for, for a good bit and it was super cold. <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> I, I did, I dressed very well, except for my feet. And that was where I failed in having good footwear and good socks. Forgot the trash bag for your right foot. 
I did not need the trash bag for my right foot. Uh, but I will tell you, Harold, there, there is a trash bag in the vehicle at all times, just in case I need it. I, I have that bags that are spe specifically to put over my driving foot. If it does rain, you need like one welly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's right. Spent a good couple hours there. And then Dana broke out. He has a drone, broke out the drone. And you probably saw, I, I had posted some uh, photos to the Facebook page and just the, the drone shot was just really, really cool and amazing uh, because the sun came out. You see a sea of white covered trees and then the, the road kind of down the center off into the distance. And then there's the, there's the, the defender right down the bottom corner. Mm. I actually, just today, we're recording on Friday, uh, February 26th. I ordered a print copy on Sunday and it's, uh, it's now in the house. I <laughs> got it that quick. It's so like a poster size. I like that image so much. Yeah, I, I did. It is a nice picture. I should have taken my white truck. I could have gotten lost. <laughs> I think you would have. <laughs> and it, it was just a, a drive and we didn't expect to kind of get into anything. Not that we really did, but it just was one of those happens, those, those kind of a beautiful part of winter just at the right time. Uh, it was sunny for the most part, kind of, you know, mostly sunny and uh, ended up being, as I said, really, just really nice and beautiful. If you've not seen the photos, I'd suggest you go out and check those out on the center steer page. And I did hear some grumblings from others uh, in the area. They're like, yeah, I didn't get invited. Well, we didn't, you know, we were just going to just to kind of get out and, and take a drive and turned out to be kind of a wonderful, nice day. We didn't, you know, we didn't get any trouble. It was a nice time. So I thought I'd report that because it was, a, it was nice to get out. And as long as you didn't burn up your gearbox trying to get up a hill, I'm fine. <laughs> no, no, there was <laughs> none of that. None of that. No. <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're quite welcome. All right. Now time for the news. JLR's amazing recovery continues. JLR continues to make an impressive financial recovery following significant losses over the last two years. The automaker's latest 2020 global sales report states it made a pre-tax profit of $603 million during the third quarter of the fiscal year, which is October, of course, through just end of December. Some of the key contributing factors include a 20% increase in China sales compared to the previous quarter and a 19.1% increase year on year. Global sales dropped 9% compared to quarter three of 2019 and the new Defender has been a hot commodity with sales reaching 66,286 units, an impressive 66% increase from the uh, quarter prior. So, so in other words, the, the new Defender, if it, it, thanks to the new Defender, uh, the sales only dropped 9%. That's probably a better way to put that. You, I think you are correct, Harold. And it probably would have been much better had they not had difficulty getting things shipped around the world from, right. from their production. Yeah. And another article specifically mentions that the Land Rover Defender has crossed a monthly run rate of 5,000 units and has an order book of over 14,000 units. Cumulatively, it means that the nearly three months of sales are already accounted for. Sales of the Defender grew 66%. So that's the good side. On the negative side, though, JLR is going to cut 2,000 jobs globally. JLR representatives said, we anticipate a net reduction of around 2,000 people from our global salaried workforce in the next physical year. And so that means it's not the manufacturing hourly folks. This is the uh, salaried folks in the office. Uh, you know, your kind of white collar office workers are going to uh, be affected by that, unfortunately. Well, those are the people that contribute to overhead, no matter how many you sell or don't sell. True. And I will discuss this in a little bit, but I wonder how much it has to do with the restructuring that's happening. I think it's part of the restructuring. I think what they call reimagine. And I also think it's a leftover from the pre whatever the previous name was accelerate or something. Uh, I suspect. Right. Yeah. They got a fancy name for, for what they do like all the time. <laughs> right. Exactly. And I, you know, if you were to, Probably at this point, if you were to cut factory workers, that would cut to the bone. And I think that would, you know, so I think that's why you're seeing the white collar. Well, you want to, you want to kill your production last because those are the ones that are making something you can sell. And speaking of reimagine, JLR announced a new global strategy called reimagine under the plan. I'll read you a good bit of this article here because it's instructive. Uh, Land Rover will launch six new electric models within the next five years with the first all electric 
vehicle arriving in 2024. In other words, expect a lot of Land Rover EVs between 2024 and 26. Every nameplate in the garage, the Land Rover says the Range Rover Discovery Defender nameplates will stick around, though the overall lineup may shift. We'll offer an electric option by 2030 when electric vehicles are expected to represent 60% of Land Rover sales. According to Car and Driver, Land Rover will also phase out diesel engines by 2026. The reimagining of Jaguar will be even more comprehensive and ambitious. The brand will go 100% electric starting in 2025. According to Autocar, that could involve potentially abandoning many of the traditional market segments as well as pushing further the brand up market, perhaps as far as to become a Bentley competitor. <laughs> more surprising, Jaguar is killing the planned update to the XJ sedan and almost already EV, although the nameplate may return some time in the future. According to reports allegedly surfaced from insiders by car and driver, the sexy saloon's iPACE based powertrain didn't offer enough range or performance to match market expectations. Land Rover should come out here well. The brand looks to keep, modernize, and enhance most of its product lineup with a combination of electric power, hybridized engines, and even some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, according to reports. This should keep it competitive with established players like Mercedes-Benz and upstarts like Rivian, which is essentially launching as an electric adventure alternative to Land Rover. Where this is vague, though, is how things will work out for Jaguar. The all-electric I-Pace is at present Jaguar's only vehicle that could carry over to 2025. If premium electric XJ sedan-ish Tesla fighter isn't a part of the future, and we presume Jaguar hasn't been planning to produce a badass electric sports coupe, the new version could be very unlike the Jaguar we know. Well, I mean, everything they make now is already unlike the Jaguar we know. So that's not that big a stretch. Well, except for the XJ sedan, right? That was still yeah. kind of, but no. Yeah, vaguely, but even it wasn't really old school Jag. So big changes coming. Uh, that's part of the reimagine. And you probably heard some of that. Uh, we, we all knew that was going to be happening. It was None of it came as a surprise. Maybe the timing is a little more aggressive than, than we'd been expecting. But it was not, nothing about it was earth shattering. Although the cancellation of the XJ was a little bit of a surprise because if they're going to go all electric, you'd think they'd want to hold on to all the all electric stuff they already have. Maybe, I guess, if performance and range was disappointing, they didn't want to start out on a bad foot. That wouldn't be good for them with, you know, the successes that they've had with the I-Pace suddenly having something that doesn't compete. Otherwise, that might just sort of kill the brand off. Yeah. I think, you know, if they, if they really want to be the premium all-electric brand, they need to do an electric sports car and they need to get back the fastest production car with an electric motor. Yeah. That would fit the niche for them very well, too. Yeah, go back to their roots of being fast, grace, space, and pace, and do it electrically. Well, maybe maybe that might happen, Harold, with the cancellation of the XJ. Maybe that was not in the right place and figure cut their losses. And They need to bring back the E-type. And, you know, it's E. It's, it's electric, it's right? E, it's so. right. <laughs> <laughs> and you already have aftermarket folks putting electric motors in the, in the old E-type. Right. So JAG needs to do it themselves and they need to do it badass or, or you know, do an XJ220E. Right. Yeah. Overall, the... The presentation that new CEO gave was was interesting, but like like Harold said, most of it is not anything groundbreaking in terms of what we'd already heard discussed, except for just how soon some of those those changes are happening. I think they should have called this phase accelerate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the I'm still interested in hearing how the uh, how the fuel cell hydrogen fuel cell is going to work out in their sort of time plan. Thank you for asking, because that's the next article, which is uh, leading to <laughs> nice. that. You're, you're very kind of you. JLR is developing a hydrogen fuel cell powered powertrain, the prototype of which is set to be tested on UK roads within the next 12 months. The car maker confirmed the news today, that's the 15th of February, as part of its plans to reimagine, which I think we should rename Accelerate, uh, the future of Jaguar Land Rover as the company strives to achieve net zero carb emissions uh, across the supply chain, products, and operations by 2039. JLR said in line with the maturing of the hydrogen economy, development is already underway of a hydrogen fuel cell powertrain, which will arrive on UK roads within the next 12 months as part of a long-term investment program. 
JLR representative said, quote, at the heart of reimagine will be the electrification of both the Jaguar and Land Rover brands. Electrification is truly exciting for us. He continued, but we will not limit ourselves to pure electric as the hydrogen economy accelerates to clean decarbonization of global industry. Fuel cell technology is the logical complementary step to ready ourselves for the expected adoption of this natural energy source of the future. We will be testing prototypes on UK roads this year, unquote. What's natural about a hydrogen fuel cell? (laughs) <laughs> Isn't it the most abundant? Yeah, it requires a whole lot of industrial process just to make it. Yeah. But there's a huge embodied footprint that, that goes into manufacturing before you even switch it on. And it's expensive. It's very expensive. But I mean, you know, 10 years from now, it, may, it might might be affordable and mainstream, but right. it's going to take a while. I mean, it's great that they're testing it. That's That's step number one. But to be feasible, I think we're still looking five to 10 years out. Yeah. And I think it's more feasible in the UK and Europe than it is, say, here in the US, where that's a, a whole lot of infrastructure that's got to be built right. um, for an, the entire country. And, and yeah, to be honest, we have a whole lot more wide open space than they do. Right. Which is going to hamper all sorts of electric vehicles, not just the, the hydrogen fuel cell stuff. Yeah. And I mean, the hydrogen fuel cell stuff is going to be, you know, more appropriate for the Defender and some of those where you want want range for a heavier vehicle. Right. Well, it's good that they're not putting all their eggs in one basket with electric and you know, looking to diversify with uh, another option, which is very good. Well, it's still an electric vehicle. It's just a different storage medium. They're producing the electricity as opposed to storing it in a battery. But but the drivetrain is still an electric vehicle either way. It's just how you make your electricity. Yeah. Leads us into the, the, the next story I had, which is uh, uh, explaining the differences between the electric vehicle types. We had a, uh, a listener uh, message me that it was painful to listen to us talk about it and explain it the last time. So we have a, a link to an article called Cocoon Vehicles, and they explain that there's four different kinds. I'll just kind of try to briefly go through them and, ex- and read what they have here. There's a PHEV, which is the plug-in hybrid electric car, effectively a bridge between a regular hybrid vehicle and an electric car, but on the onboard battery requires a charge via a standard three plug or home charging solution. It also has an engine, usually petrol to take over when the battery runs out. Then there's the BEV, the battery electric vehicle. All aspects of the traditional diesel or petrol engines have been replaced by electric motors and the vehicle carries very large lithium battery packs to power the car. MHEV, mild hybrid electric vehicle. Essentially, the electric motor assists the traditional engine, generally at low speeds, to keep the emissions down as well as providing additional power for systems such as air conditioning and engine cooling systems. The electric motors can also provide an an extra boost, enabling the vehicle to accelerate a little quicker than those without the mild hybrid system, as well as allowing the engine to cut out for coasting duties so the essential systems like power steering still function. And it allows you to use a smaller engine as well, so better fuel efficiency and, and less fewer emissions. And finally, there's the HEV, hybrid electric engines. In simple terms, the hybrid is a traditional combustion engine that works alongside an electric motor. The battery pack on board is charged as the engine, as well as things like uh, brake regeneration. And then unfortunately, there are several types of hybrids, HEVs. So let's break it down. There's the parallel hybrid, which is like a Toyota Prius. There's the plug-in hybrid, like the uh, Golf GTE, which we mentioned before earlier is the PHEV, and the range extender hybrid, like the BMW uh, i3 range extender. It would just have technology as well. Yeah. So I hope that clean, clears things up. Oh yeah, clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> So I apologize, listener, if it's all confusing, but it's still, that that helped a bit, but I think there's still some confusion there. Clearly there's some overlap on the different technologies and what they're called. And I suspect that different manufacturers also probably handle it a little differently and how they want to. Well, they want to get their own little trademark name on it. Yeah. And in many cases, they have to get their own little trademark name on it because the other <laughs> other implementation is already trademarked. Or patented. Or patented. Sorry. Yes. Then with JD Power and Associates came out with their annual reliability 
this is, I'm sorry, this is the dependability survey. And Lexus has regained the top spot in the annual dependability survey, while Land Rover has found itself at the bottom of the list for the second year running. The study, which ranks car brands sold in the U.S. based on the number of problems reported by customers for every 100 new vehicles sold over a 12-month period, found overall vehicle reliability was at an all-time high. The average manufacturer experienced 1.21 faults per car, which is down from 1.34 from the previous reporting period. And Lexus, uh, for the, the 2021 dependability study, Lexus has 81 faults per 100 cars, and the average is 1.21, as mentioned. Jaguar, 1.86. Alfa Romeo, 1.96. Land Rover, 2.44. Which actually is an improvement over previous years. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> but, you know, you don't buy British vehicles for their dependability and their reliability. It's just not part of the experience. Uh, that's right. Yeah, you're you're buying a Lexus, you're buying a Kia, you're buying Toyota. You, you buy that stuff because you don't appreciate the things that make a British vehicle a British vehicle. You're buying the Lexus and the Toyota and those things because you need a soulless transportation appliance. I can't disagree with your comments there, Harold. Yes. If you disagreed with me, we wouldn't be here on this show. You are correct. Interestingly, the number two on the dependability sur survey under Alexis at which is at 81 or 8.1, 8 uh, or 0 0.81. 0 0.81. Is Porsche, 0 0.86. Then Kia, then Toyota, hmm. Buick, Cadillac, Hyundai, hmm. Genesis. I was kind of surprised that Porsche was so high in the ranking. Oh, they they engineered that thing to death. Modern cars are safe, but high higher speed crashes reveal serious weakness. I realize this is a general car thing, and we've talked about car safety over the during the podcast. And this study came out, and I thought it was uh, worth a read. It's absolutely true. Modern cars are much more safer than vehicles from even 15 years ago. But just because automakers made massive strides in structural integrity and airbag technology doesn't mean the average car is invincible. This is precisely what a new study published this past week from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and AAA found. That's all here in the U.S. The groups looked at rising speed limits across the country and what it means for average modern car, which is at about 12 years old in 2021. Uh, they took a handful of 2010 Honda CRV crossovers and they crash tested them at incremental speeds. First, the CRV crashed at 40 miles an hour and it held up well with minimal intrusion in the cockpit. Jumping to 50 miles an hour, the vehicle showed noticeable deformation of the driver's side door opening, dashboard, and foot area. It's precisely what you don't want in the event of a crash as parts and components push inward and threaten occupants. In the third and final crash test, the vehicle was sent careening into a wreck at just 56 miles per hour. And it was noted that the CRV's interior was significantly compromised. Worse, the crashed dummy registered neck injuries and a sign of a fractured leg bones. With just a six mile per hour increase in speed from 50 miles per hour, drivers have a far greater chance at injury. At both 50 miles per hour and 56 miles per hour, however, steering wheel movement also caused the dummy's head to push through the airbag and its face to collide with the steering wheel. The possibility of facial fractures, and severe brain injury rated high risk at these speeds. So the dummy had a very pointy nose and he popped the bag. <laughs> Just goes to show the, those high speeds. <laughs> doesn't matter how good your safe your car is, there's still going to be a problem. Ener so. And the energy of the collision increases with the square of the speed. And these are... It's, it's not linear. No, it, it's not linear. And, and uh, you know, it's obviously significantly worse if you were to get into a, a front end collision with a vehicle moving the opposite direction, which is actually increased in likelihood when you're traveling those speeds because barriers uh, tend to not, not hold you back. Right. The, the interesting thing is the energy of the collision does increase in a linear fashion with increasing mass of the vehicle hmm. and so what, the mass of the vehicle does actually help you. So if you're going to go faster, do it in something bigger. <laughs> right. <laughs> we obviously this article came out. It wasn't planned, but just this past week, you know, Tiger Woods had his accident and roll, rolled the, was it a Hyundai right. Genesis? Yes. And it was interesting to hear the, um, but the, the police afterwards were talking about how the car was destroyed and the bumper completely came off and this happened and this happened. And I'm like the car did its job. 
Yeah, yes. exactly. It the bumper's right. supposed to come off. Yeah, it, yes, and, and it was supposed to deform. The wheel, and, and, wheels and, are supposed to come off. All the stuff that gets torn off and goes flying in different, rec- different directions takes energy of the collision away from the driver. Exactly. And I'm like, why didn't the cops know this? Like, they talked about because it. Because like the it cops just- are not engineers. So what this article is really summarizing is that uh, we really should be sticking with 55 Stay Alive. I th- that's it's a that's a good point. Yes, go go slower. They they do they did mention that you know especially here in America you know posted speed limits are you know it's it's, it's a notional idea. People are yeah. still going ten miles an hour. They're just over. a suggestion, yeah. right? You know when it's posted mm-hmm. to be fifty five or seventy, people are still do- or they're doing ten over makes it worse. Well, and, and that was that was my argument with the uh, the smart cars because they're so incredibly tiny, you've got nothing around you to protect you from, from intrusion and stuff. And maybe at 30 miles an hour, that's one thing, but they talk about the great fuel mileage they get, but for the same fuel mileage, I can have a Jetta wagon. that has a lot more steel around me. Yeah. I've seen some of the crash videos of the smart vehicles and it's uh, scary. It's yeah. It's surprisingly resilient yet. That means that you're just like bouncing around like a ping pong ball inside. Yes, I would agree with that. Well, they were made for driving around town at, at 10 miles an hour or whatever. They're, they're a city car. For Europe. European city car, small, Which, tight spaces, exactly. But in this country, I just don't think they're suitable. No. There's one that drives around here with a, with a wind-up key on the back that spins around. <laughs> I have seen that. I have seen that. <laughs> and of course, we've, we've not mentioned uh, us driving old defenders made of aluminum skin and steel frame but well you know the part that's in right in front of me is all steel and you know where that's going it's come right into the cabin there's nothing to stop it although i admit i'm more worried about side impact than i am about a front impact but yeah i'm not worried about frontal impact because you got a lot of frame in front of you you got an engine you've got to accelerate that engine's going to bounce off the steel firewall and and uh I'm not worried. Yeah, the frontal crash isn't the big deal. It's yeah, it is the side impact. Yeah. And I have in, especially in the, the Defender, I taking a little extra time to look in that vehicle, especially when I'm at an intersection to make sure that someone has stopped in the, you know, in the opposite direction, not the opposite, the, the perpendicular direction in you know, 90 degree, just to make sure they, they don't, aren't blowing a yellow light or a red light. My, I grew up in Minnesota. I learned that habit early on because you don't always know if the guy can stop. Uh, right. you, know, you always wait to make sure nobody's going to slide through. Right? Cause I've, you know, I've had people do it to me. I've done it to them. You just kind of like wave as you go sliding past. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> it's just the Minnesota nice thing to do. All right, moving on. Goodyear to acquire Cooper Tire for $2.8 billion. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and Cooper Tire and Rubber Company announced that they have entered a definitive transaction agreement under which Goodyear will acquire Cooper for $2.5 billion. Uh, Cooper, founded in 1914, is the fifth largest tire manufacturer in North America by revenue with approximately 10,000 employees working in 15 countries worldwide. Cooper products are manufactured in 10 facilities around the globe, including wholly owned and joint venture plants. The company's portfolio of brands includes Cooper, Mastercraft, Roadmaster, and Mickey Thompson. So if you're a Cooper tire purchaser like I am, I guess it's all now part of Goodyear. I wonder if that's going to change how those two companies do their sponsorship of, of motor racing. Oh yeah. And what's with all these sub brands? They really need to have Mastercraft and Well, it gives you house brands at, at certain stores. Well, I guess the one good thing about the coming ele- electrification, you're still going to need uh, rubber tires. That's not changing. Not anytime soon. Might get to the the fancy newfangled airless tires, but they're still rubber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've been playing with those for about 50 years now and they still haven't got those right, so I don't know. Exactly. And back to Land Rover news. Land Rover celebrates selling 1 million Range Rover Sport vehicles. Uh, In an official video, JLR is celebrating the 1 millionth Range Rover Sport sold this year, marking a milestone in the nameplate's 15 years of existence. Introduced in 2004, first as a concept called the Range Stormer, the Range Rover Sport has grown to become one of the best-selling Land Rovers of all time. I was going to say, that's got to be near the top top of the list as far as their most popular model. Although I do suspect that the new Defender is going to give it a run for its money. Speaking of the new Defender, uh, the next, I don't know, 5,000 stories are all new <laughs> the, Defender. The rest of the show. <laughs> I guarantee you, listener, there is one story, one, I think one story that is not Defender related. Uh, yes, at the, at the very end. 
the rest of the, the rest of the stories here are defender related autoblog here in the United States had a very nice, I thought a good overall summary review. Another one. I know uh, there was another one last month. This was uh, autoblogs. Uh, 2021 Land Rover Defender review. Uh, it's uh, subtitled as a rugged off-roader or a characterful, caricature full midsize luxury SUV. The Defender is exceptional. I'm not going to read any of it to you, but if you are interested in buying one or want to know more about it, especially here in the U.S. and what's going on with it, on-road manners, off-road manners, uh, storage, uh, maybe some things that you maybe don't want, like. Uh, they're like the seventh seat. They basically say that third row of seats is uh, useless and uh, they don't recommend it. Third row seats are almost always useless on the Land Rover product. It's just part of the tradition. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd recommend take, uh, check out this, uh, check out this article. There's I mean, a, how they, they ever classified a one Oh nine as a 12 passenger vehicle is just beyond me. <laughs> how big are these passengers? Are they, are they, yeah. are they including kids? Apparently they would have to be. <laughs> uh, there's also a companion piece on luggage testing in the 110 that you may want to check out. Uh, they explain and how much can go in and where and how and why. And it was, a, it was another useful article there. There's uh, one I hadn't heard. There's a bonus storage under the cargo area uh, next to the uh, jack. So kind of a hidden space there. Mm, they smugglers hatch. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as the uh, Jetta sport wagons smuggler hatch though. Yeah. There's a couple of spots in the Jetta. Yeah. There's one, there's one I forget about that even it, you know, you, oh, oh yeah. I mean, I know it's there, but I've never used it. I've never used it. I know. Like, I've opened it why? twice. <laughs> why? It's like, oh yeah, that's in there. Well then the, the spare tire compartment is twice as big as it needs to be. I mean, really you put everything you need for, for a month in there. And then there's that little hatch in front of it that you just, yeah, you never remember you have because there's just no need. And it's hard to get to too, because you usually yeah. have a cover over it. So when you, uh, you open up the hatch in the back of the, the Jetta sport wagon. So this is the station wagon, the estate. And uh, then there, I have a cover. So you lift up the cover and then there's a hatch, you lift up the hatch and that reveals a storage area. And you have to lift up that storage area to get to the spare tire, which has, you know, as Harold said, storage there. But in front of that second, hatch second door there's another one in front of it that is hidden because you can't see it because you have your your carpet covering it but there's another hatch there and it's the length it's the width of the vehicle and you could probably you could store a good bit of stuff in there I and mean, you can't get a six pack in there but you could get uh you know a good sizable amount of cash a couple kilos of weed <laughs> and it's right behind the rear it's right behind the rear seat but yeah you forget about it be, and the only time I've seen it or looked in there is when I clean it out and I take out the, take out the extra carpet and I go, Oh, that's right. There's that storage there. I mean, it's like, and you never need the stuff that's in those compartments and do you have the whole trunk full of crap anyway? So it's just like, and then when you want to put something in there, you know, you're going to need it. You're going to have to take, you're, you're going to have everything in the, uh, in the back of the truck because right. you're the back of the vehicles, you're going somewhere. And I'm like, Oh, I guess. You know. see, see now if, if it were a Rover product, then that would be a really cool thing because that's where you keep your spare fuel pump, your spare hoses, right. all the stuff you need to, to make it back home again. <laughs> I, I think this defines that we have reached peak ice internal combustion engine this week, Land Rover announced they're putting a V8 in the new Defender. We knew it was coming, even though they said, you know, for the last two years, they're not going to do it. You don't need it. Yeah, it'll be happening. Trust me. And let me read you this article. It's, it's, it's nice to read. Of course, it starts off with 2020, 2022 Land Rover Defender V8 to start at $98,550 US. The 110 will start at $101,750. So that's a bargain compared to the 90. Land Rover announced US <laughs> pricing for its 2022 Defender lineup, including the brand new V8 model. The short wheelbase 90 will start at as I said, 98,550, including 1,350 for destination. The 110 will start at 101,750. The rest of the lineup sees some pricing adjustments as well. The base Defender 90 climbs $1,600 to 49,050. The 110's base price, 51,850, remains the same. And some other tweaks were made across the lineup. There are also new models, and I use that in quotes, Besides the V8 for 2022, the Defender 90 range extends from just four models to eight, with the first edition being scrapped for the new X Dynamic S, the SE, and the HSE models, all powered by a 395 horsepower inline six being added. 
The 110 lineup was similarly expanded, going from just three variants to nine. It also picks up the X Dynamic and the SE and the HSE models, along with a unique XS edition, also based on the inline six, that includes some dress up elements. Land Rover clarified that this model is exclusive to the 110. Earlier reports suggested it was going to be on the 90, and that is the XS edition. And if you say it real fast, it sounds like excess. <laughs> <laughs> they need to follow it up with the Can-Am edition where excess was barely adequate. <laughs> they, they, although I think they should have, that should be the V8 models so designation, the excess. The Defender V8 will have some competition on the domestic front or straight away thanks to Jeep, which announced Wednesday, no coincidence, we're certain, that this, that it's, 2021 Wrangler Rubicon 392 launch edition will start at $74,995, including $1,500 for destination. So there's some competition, which is about, what was that, $20,000 less. Right. Or and for the same price, you can have the uh, Grand Cherokee Trackhawk with with the Hellcat engine and, and the uh, track mode and launch mode and all the really cool, fun, hooning about things that it comes with. As part of the new V8 that Land Rover's coming out with on the Defender, they put out a video, which I highly recommend. It's 13 minutes. You got to check it out. They're just showing off now <laughs> <'cause> they, <laughs> as because as part of this can. video, <laughs> they spend a minute and a half explaining how you can drift in a Defender. <laughs> I love it. It's, fan, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, explain, explaining or mansplaining? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just... I think it was explained. We'll just go with explain. Uh, all right. Yeah, okay. I, I don't think it doesn't sound mansplained to me. Uh, it just explain and they 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 explain they explain how the you know they'll the, it, the defender will break it will not break it will have downforce it will lock the differential unlock the differential all the things that it needs to do and while it's chugging along at speed and will allow it just to, just enough to drift as it goes around a bend it's fantastic it's fantastic drift a bit and not not full on ken block stuff no, no, but it, no, but you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a bowler. The, the way they show this is going around a bend and especially the 90. Yeah, it's Land like, Rover does own bowler. So it would be an easy thing to harness that technology and those people. Yeah. Yep. But it, this is just further proof of just how hard you have to work to lose traction in a defender. And then not only did they do some upgrades to the electronics to, to have this happen. They also upgraded uh, some of the hardware. They uh, upgraded the brakes. Uh, this is all for the V8 edition. They also uh, have uh, four tips coming out the back for the exhaust, some twin four tipped exhaust and uh, the special colors. And I think special interior, special exterior. I think you, the, uh, roof, the top comes in black now for the V8 edition. So there's a bunch of things happening uh, on the inside and on the outside for the V8 edition, which I think, as I said, is uh, peak ice, you know, internal. Does the speedometer engine. go to 11? <laughs> <laughs> it is 525 horsepower, Harold. All right. Well, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that doesn't actually sound all that stunning, but I mean, yeah, it's great, but I mean, V8s, they, they, they're getting big horsepower. I mean, again, the 707 you can get from, from the Chrysler products. And that's not even their biggest V8. Moving on in Defender news, this is a rumor that the Defender pickup might be coming to fight the Ford Ranger. The 110 has already outsold its predecessor in America, and sales will only increase when Land Rover adds the more affordable 90 to the lineup. It's coming here in America this spring. Potentially, this isn't the only new Defender variant Land Rover is plotting. There have been rumors that Land Rover is has been planning to build a pickup version of the Defender, but the project was allegedly scrapped. According to Autocar, however, the project appears to be back on. Speaking to the publication, Nick Collins, JLR's executive director of vehicle programs, believes there is customer demand for a Defender pickup, and there were no structural limitations to building one. Quote, we always said the Defender would be a family. Collins added, hinting that we should watch the space when asked about launching a Defender pickup. The publication claims the Defender pickup will be offered with a choice of gasoline and diesel engines taken from the regular Defender and will only be sold with a 110-inch wheelbase. In the U.S., a Land Rover pickup truck could compete against the Ford Ranger as well uh, as well as the Ranger. It would also take on the Volkswagen Amarok in Europe and the Toyota Land Cruiser in South America and well, in Africa. Not to mention in the U.S., it would be a direct competitor for the Jeep Gladiator. Right. I think that's a better comparison, yes. Which will be available with the 707 horsepower Hellcat. <laughs> 
sorry, not to not to toot Jeep's horn, but they're doing it better. I'm sorry, but they are. If in that situation, yeah, nothing wrong with that. But would not the Land Rover be subject to the 25% import tax on pickups? Yeah, yes, they would. Oh, absolutely. So that, Chicken tax. That would go yeah. up even more. Yeah. Unless they do the Subaru Brat thing and throw a couple seats and belts in the back. And <laughs> well, that, well, that'd be cool. <laughs> with, with quick release fasteners so you can throw them away. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Maybe even a dealer recycling program for those. And you probably saw this video. It was worth mentioning. Again, the Land Rover Defender tows a massive car transporter on ice with ease. And when delivering seven new Land Rovers to the Stafford dealership in the UK, car transporter got stuck on icy snow covered roads. That's where the Defender came into its own and managed to pull the transporter. Admittedly, this isn't a simple case of the Defender pulling the truck from a dead stop without any assistance. Instead, the driver of the truck was also hitting the throttle, providing the Land Rover with a little bit of extra traction and power it needed to start moving forward. Still, it was an impressive feat regardless. So if you didn't see the, the video, it's your chance to, it was impressive. Still, still impressive. <laughs> even, even yeah, it re reminds me of, of the uh, winter romp video from 10 or so years back where they had, somebody was stuck in a Range Rover, I think, and they were trying to pull it with a Defender. And so the Range Rover is spinning wheels, the Defender spinning wheels. So they hook a Freelander to the front of that and finish it off. The little Freelander ends up adding just enough extra pull. Just enough. Yep. A uh, new Land Rover Defender transformed into hardcore off-roader. Demand for the new Defender has been high. It's already outsold predecessors in the U.S. Land Rover already offers an abundance of accessories to make it look more rugged and improve its off-road prowess, but that hasn't stopped the aftermarket tuner from taking the off-roader to the next level and transforming into an even more hardcore off-roader. And some details here. An aggressive bull bar give the new Defender a meaner look, while a two-inch lift kit improves the off-roader's Already impressive ground clearance. New LED light bar improves visibility for nighttime adventures. They put that on the bull bar in front. And custom exhaust system with dual three-inch tips make the soundtrack more aggressive. New luxuries have also been fitted, including a fridge and an 80-channel CB radio. And the reason I brought this up was because it reminded me of our guest coming up, uh, Alex Truck. I think that bull bar looked very similar to what he has added to his truck. Still, we're still in Defender news, but this is the old Defender. Land Rover launches Rough Ready Retro Defender V8 Trophy Edition. Land Rover's Classic Division has released a limited run of 25 of the Retro Defender Works V8 Trophy based on the now defunct old school Defender. Among those produced will be both two-door 90 and the four-door 110, all in Esnor yellow, color reminiscent of Camel Trophy, entries from the 80s and 90s. The, it will not be sold in the U.S. It is based on the existing chassis. Uh, <laughs> they're, uh, in other words, their aftermarket conversions, both short wheelbase two-door 90 and long wheelbase 110 station wagons would be produced with power coming from a naturally aspirated uh, five-point liter V8 from JLR producing 399 horsepower, 390, 379 pound-feet of torque. Eight-speed automatic gearbox will also be standard, something no original Defender left the factory with. But lots of aftermarket folks are making all over the world. So I yeah. think Land Rover just wanted to horn in on that business because everybody's making amateur Camel Trophy poser trucks, so why not uh, do some of our own? Call it a, a genuine, authentic Camel Trophy poser truck. <laughs> The obvious difference between the earlier Works V8 and the Works V8 Trophy is the custard yellow paint scheme of the new car referencing the Camel Trophy that ran between 1980 and 2000 and which Land Rover supplied vehicles for. The cigarette sponsorship has obviously gone and the color is now referred to as Esner Yellow after Land Rover's English test center. But the connection to the adventurous event is further emphasized by a substantial external roll cage and additionally underbody protection, a raised air intake, and an electric winch. Other mechanical changes from the base Defender include bigger brakes and new telescopic dampeners. It will cost a substantial amount, although not available in the U.S., they've converted to U.S. dollars, $270,000. Yeah, that's why Land Rover wanted to do it. Yeah. But they only... <laughs> They, what, they only saved 25 or found 25 laying around the UK to... Well, I mean, there's a, it's a limited market at that price point. They all sold out in like 10 minutes. 
Yeah, exactly. And and that's how you want to do it. You want to you want to launch an edition, you want to do a limited run, you want to sell them right away. If they done 50 or 60 and, and only sold 40 of them, they got to try and and they got to make some effort to move those last 20. But if they only do 25 and they boom, they're done, then then that's a win. It's like Jag and they're they're uh, finishing out the production of the uh, XKSSs that that they never built. And they sold those in in a day for what one point three million a piece. One more Defender bit of information, but this is old Defender, a two thousand three real Rover, Defender, a two thousand three Land Rover Defender. They from a German gentleman, and he's the owner of the four x four Experience. Uh, Michael Ortner donated a door, and they and a company turned called Rec Watches turned that door into a wristwatch. So it's like a recycled Defender door. When I first read about this, I thought I was concerned that they they found just Defenders on the side of the road and junked them. And then, but this is nice to know it was a door that he just, I guess he replaced the door. Roll and up to one in a it. car park, you can steal a door in, in under a minute. That's right. <laughs> or take a bonnet. They just lift right off. <laughs> Midnight supply. They're all set. So you can now get a wristwatch that looks reminiscent of the bonnet from overhead. Uh, the crown and the bezel kind of have a f- kind of a ode to a more of a defender you know, bonnet. And uh, they use, of course, the door for the metal that is the, the bezel and the body of the watch. And you can get one of those. And there's also another watch. This one, though, is based off of a 1981 Series 3 owned by a Portuguese photographer and filmmaker, Daniel Esposito Santo. And I think he donated a roof so they can make a watch. I wonder if you have to like set it on a towel whenever you take it off so that it doesn't leave an oil spot. <laughs> <laughs> and hope it doesn't let the smoke out. Yeah, yeah, and stop working. Yeah, Lucas Electrics are no joke. <laughs> and finally, we're out of Defender news. This is a song written by Katie Page. This is an original song by Katie Page telling the story of her first weekend in Montana. It became a memorable and amazing experience with the Montana Rover Club driving through Yellowstone. And she wrote a song about it called Overland Breakdowns. And featured in the video is our own Oxford. She was with uh, the Montana Club as they went into Oxford and they... uh, and she wrote a song about it, about the breakdowns. Which means that actually kind of is Defender news. If you take the Land Rover view that the series truck is an, a backwards extension of the Defender line. Well, without the series, there would be no Defender. Correct. It's part of the lineage. Listener, go out to our webpage and there will be a link to her song and to the to YouTube to Overland Breakdowns. Go ahead and check it out. She's an original singer songwriter. She's written other songs, but this is uh, this is one here is about Overland Breakdowns and features Oxford. Apparently she's a rover person, but I, I believe so. Or at least was inspired by one, so she deserves our support for that, I guess. And that's the news for February 2021. And now on the Center Steer podcast, all the way from Pensacola, Florida, is Alec Bro, who is a member of the Gulf Coast Land Rover Club. Welcome to the show, Alec. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you doing this on short notice. Yeah, no worries. No worries. And the reason for the short notice is that you're starting a new Land Rover rally in Pensacola. It's called the Pensa Rover Rally. So uh, tell us about it. Well, we haven't had any events here in a couple of years or nearby, and I've, I've kind of seen a, a need or maybe a want, a selfish want to get together with a lot of the other guys. Uh, the last rally I went to was three years ago, uh, three or four years ago. I can't even remember because <laughs> at the time yes. I, I had gotten rid of my, my last Land Rover. I had taken a two-year hiatus and I came back into it. I missed it. Anyway, uh, yeah, I love where I live. Uh, it's, to me, it's the best place in the world, and I want to show it off. I want to show off the, the trail rides that we have available, as well as our downtown and just the nearby attractions to everybody who might want to take a drive. Wonderful. And that's going to be April 24th of 2021. That is correct. It's a one-day event? It's a one-day event. We can spill into two. Uh, if I have the interest, I've lined up with another if you want to get into a fun event, the Florabama down in uh, the Alabama line, Florida, Alabama line has their annual mullet toss that weekend, <laughs> which is literally what it sounds like throwing dead fish as far as you can on the beach. 
And I've talked to their event coordinator and she said, we're welcome to come on Sunday as well. I, I, I conjured up an entirely different view when you said mullet toss, but okay. <laughs> if you haven't heard of it, it is a surprise. <laughs> you don't know what to expect. I figured it was some sort of hairdo contest. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they have that too. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about the Pensa Rover rally a bit later, but you said you uh, had took a little hiatus from Land Rovers, but, but how did, uh, how did you get the disease? How, how are you? Uh... Family and, uh, you know, growing up, my dad had uh, a Range Rover back in the day. Uh, he had the first L322 model and I fell in love with them. Then I'd grown up around others. I'd seen the P38s for years and they had their n- notoriety. And now I have one and it certainly lives up to it. It's currently dead in the parking lot. You fully um, understand it now, don't you? Yeah, exactly. I've had a few L322s over the years and, uh, Decided to take a break for a little while. Well, the last one I had was over 100,000 miles, and now I'm back in full force. I've got number six, seven, or excuse me, no, seven, eight, and nine in the parking lot right now. It's okay. it's sad that they think of a 322 as an old Range Rover. Now, yeah, I love it, though. I, I okay. really wish I hadn't sold it. And that was your very first? That was the first and the last that I had before the hiatus. And did you give it a name? No, unfortunately, no names. I, America seems to be up and down. You know, it's 50-50 whether you name your, your truck or not. It's, sure. it's from, from what I've seen. Uh, did you take that off-road? Did you take that on uh, any uh, you know cross-country trips or overlanding? The last one that I had attended a few rallies here in town. Uh, I guess I missed you at the very last one because I had sold it by then. And I did a lot of traveling with it. I've done a lot more now. I've got the new Defender, and I've been in that one from Colorado all the way down to Key West and up to Asheville. I've done the uh, Land Rover experience in Asheville. I've been all over. I've, I've got I've had it since October, and I have twelve thousand miles on it already. And it is twelve thousand miles in what is that now? Six months? Almost at five months? Hardly. And it's currently having some super secret work done to it in Arizona. So to come in the next two weeks, there will be some new product available. Uh, Optional work or warranty work? Optional work. Okay, cool. Development work on it. Okay. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, keep an eye out for that. Give us a hint. Oh, let's just say it's something that there's there's a way to do this now, but it's not um, as intense as what I'm having done. Is it something that could potentially invalidate the warranty? Oh, I'm sure. Doesn't everything invalidate the warranty? Well, I mean, the cool stuff does. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Let's just say I want my air suspension to work as normal. Oh, all right. Okay. Cool. I had a feeling it was in the lifted area of suspension and such. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 That's very cool. Very cool. Yeah. By the time the you know, the podcast comes out, it'll come out in a few days here. And then uh, we should see this mid-March, I would think, a couple of weeks. I was supposed to go to the next Land Rover Experience Owners Day, March 7th, I think it was. But unfortunately, they got delayed because of all the winter weather that we just had in Texas getting there. Right. So tell us more about the new Defender that you got to what uh, color size, assume it's obviously it's a 110. It is a 110. I love that vehicle. I've got, I bought the cheapest one I could. It was, I think 57,000, which is close to what they advertise. It was in Birmingham, Alabama, which is, you know, that's a fitting since Land Rover started in Birmingham and why not? Uh, it's an S model. It's as bare bones as you can really get. I wish it had the steel wheels, but I put aftermarket on anyway. That was going to be my first question is that, did you get the steelies? No, I couldn't find those. So I went aftermarket. I've got that, uh, the factory bull bar that they only sell in Australia and South Africa. There's a fellow new defender mods on Instagram who ships them from Australia. And I was one of the first, I think the third in the States to get that. And it was, it was intense. Let me tell you, I had to tear the whole front end apart. So if the warranty wasn't gone already, it's certainly gone. By <laughs> it's pretty gone by it, you know, I have to, it's, it's, a, isn't it amazing? At least I think it's amazing for a you know, new vehicle, brand new and people within weeks are already modding it, changing it, significantly impacting the vehicle. Don't care about the warranty and just going, you know, and, and doing the thing. I think that's fantastic. And having stuff shipped in from around the world, because I, I would, I'd like that part. I want that. Well, I mean, the cool stuff isn't made here. The cool stuff is in Australia and South Africa. Well, let me tell you, the engineering that JLR has put into that part is intense. There's, it's, it's impressive as far as they've gone with it. You've got to tear all the way in 
past the, you know, to the radiator to put this thing on. It is fully integrated with the crush cans on the front. It is meant to be pedestrian safe. I, I don't know why they don't sell it here. I've heard that they might, but there's no telling. Probably a testing thing. They might've not been able to, to do appropriate testing or something. Did, well, yeah. I suspect that because it's, uh, it, it changes the bumper out that you have to do another crash test. Maybe so. And it does hold a winch. I recently took it all apart again to put the winch in there. Uh, oh, of course. It, uh, <laughs> Good for you. Because you don't, you don't think of it when you're putting it in and thinking, oh, I'll do that later. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Two days later. Uh, yeah. I got the winch in after I did oh, it. Oh, I've, I've been there. I was like, oh, damn, I should have done that when I had the chance. <laughs> exactly. I still haven't even gotten a chance to hook it up yet because as soon as I put it in, I shipped it out to Arizona. So yeah, that's just wire. It's- did you come across the louvers in the front? The what now? There, there are louvers in the. Oh yeah. The louvers. The, yes, the louvers I did. That, yeah. That, the fan blades. I took them off. I watched that video that powerful UK had done. Uh, and that was incredibly helpful. It's all, it's the exact same installation process, except that this bar had, it basically has two extra brackets that hold the bar on, uh, with what they have done. So it was incredibly perfect timing for when they did that video. It was literally that week that I did it. So I was watching it with, with big eyes the whole time. So I took the louvers out when I first did it. The, the instructions that Land Rover has tells you to take them out and discard. Then I saw that they kept them on in their videos. So this go around when I put the winch and I added it back. Interesting that they would have you remove them. Cause I thought that I don't know. I don't know why. And they, yeah. it fits either with or without, and there's no fault codes. Nothing pops up. Yeah. And it's supposed to be there to help with, well, I guess you're in a colder or warm. warmer climate, probably not as, not as critical, but I mean, I think sure. the, the intent was to warm up the engine. Yeah. I don't know why. I, 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 I mean, surprised. I think it'd be cool if you could force them closed for a water crossing. That's a good idea. I wonder if there's a hack to do that. Is that maybe part of the censoring that when it detects, maybe when it detects water, maybe they automatically close. Maybe so. The wave mode. I haven't, yeah. I've been through some deeper stuff, but not for very long. So I don't think it had a chance to get there. So tell us about the off-roading capabilities. It's fantastic. I mean, you know, every car is good. My, my old P38 is great. It, it, it will go through whatever you throw at it. And when uh, it's working. And when it's working, yeah. It just mysteriously, after our last ride this weekend, decided to start draining its battery every night. So I don't know why. Oh, I hate when that happens. Yeah. yeah. But the new Defender, I so I took it to, I did a one day, uh, you know, just me with a Land Rover instructor at the Biltmore. And he is very impressed with it. He was very impressed, especially with my, you know, toot my own horn with how it was modified said it was probably the, you know, one of the best off-roaders they've had on that course. Now that course is very well groomed and it's, it's, uh, you know, they know exactly every bump ride, you know, whatever you're going to encounter, but it was still new to me and I was very impressed with it. To get in, get into anything hairy that, uh, kind of impressed you? Not all, well, I did a couple of little slides on there that were a little hairy for me, but, uh, no, I mean, I, I would take that car anywhere that you could possibly take a, a road vehicle. It, like we talked about, I've done 12,000 miles on it in five months or so. And to go from highway to that, there is in my mind, no better, more capable vehicle. I've, I have a L405 right now as well, which is, a very, very lovely car to drive, but you know, I'll, I'll stick with uh, either the Defender or that old P38. <laughs> what is it like on road? The new Defender? Yeah. Just as, just as comfortable as a 405. It, it rides, I mean, with the air suspension, everything seems to be the same. It rides just as well. Now I've got uh, lift rods on it, so it's a little bit more stiff at the moment, but that's why I uh, aim to achieve going back to the regular air height and all that business. And what about tires? Have you changed the changed the tires or put in you know, using? I did. I put the BFG. Uh, you know, you get everybody wants to talk on the internet about what size tires you have, what size tires you can fit. And with the rods, uh, the lift rods I have on right now, I have two seventy five, I think fifty five twenties, and that's about a thirty three inch tire, a little short of thirty three. It's a it's a BFG all terrain, the KO2, it, it rides nice. I don't notice any any crazy amount of noise, especially with all that driving. So what's the furthest you've driven it like in in a sitting? Can you go 
I mean, it's a modern vehicle, so I assume you can drive more than what two hours in a sitting without any difficulty. So, <laughs> the fun part was what I drove. Yeah, it's not a Series One. <laughs> You're right. It's not like that over the uh, the, the Oxford you know, no, trying to no. drive around town. It, it almost was one time. I was in Colorado driving home, and my turbo seized in about an hour south of Denver in Colorado Springs. And I really felt like I was driving an old series or something at that point when I couldn't get oh, over yeah. five on the interstate. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like losing their boost. That's for yeah. sure. Ooh, they do not like losing their boost. That was the only time I cursed myself for not getting the six cylinder. <laughs> also, it is the four cylinder then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. And you, and you found that to be you know pretty responsive and good for American highways? No lack of power. It's okay. almost 300 horsepower. Well, unless your turbo seizes. <laughs> <laughs> then it's three. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that was a quick fix. And I, you know, I have to throw many appreciation to those guys out there for fixing it that fast. And what about all the electronics and the, the sensors and the capability for you know terrain response? You found that to be good quality and, and useful. Oh, absolutely. It's a lot more involved than it has been. So this was my first foray back in the Land Rover since the L322s, and it's above and beyond what they have done in those. You know, the system will have glitches, and but we all love Land Rover, so we learn to appreciate them, and it's just their personality. I, I don't... I think that a lot of people now are buying these that don't understand that and they, <laughs> they want to lemon law them or you know, do something like that. Actually, fun story, the 405 that I had was a lemon law buyback. So I got it for a very reasonable price and it's been fixed, but people are just scared of what they will do. Yeah, there's, it has its glitches, but it works when I need it to. And it hasn't been an issue. It hasn't left me for dead. I've been all over, like I said, almost across the country so far at this point. I really, uh, one of the most fun experiences I had, I was in the Keys. I was in Marathon. And I pulled up to a small little restaurant on the water, hidden in a back canal somewhere. The only other car there was another new Defender. And <laughs> really, yeah, because that's so all that out. will make it there, or what? <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I get out and I, I sit down next to these people. They're talking, and I ask them. I, I was actually parked down the road a little bit, and because uh, I didn't know I could park that close to the restaurant. I get out and I hear the guys talking. And I say, Hey, is that your new defender out there? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to pull up my car and I'm going to take a picture together. Well, I don't know if they listen, but long story short, one of the other fellows said, this guy won't tell you, but he's on the board of Land Rover. And it, I was like, oh, no. I said, well, don't look, <laughs> don't look at that bar on the front. He's like, I already was taking pictures. Of it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I didn't ask the guy's name. I didn't want to get into it. I right. left anonymity at anonymity, and uh, we said our goodbyes. Oh, nice. Well, that, a nice build, and that was one of the best compliments I've ever gotten. Oh, there you go. The, yeah. He was on the, the – wow, interesting. That's what the other guy said. He yeah. didn't – I don't know, but he, yeah. he had driven – at that point, he had about the same amount of mileage, and you know it hadn't been out for that long. This right. was in November or December, so he had twelve thousand miles at that point. I think I may have seen something seen. tells me though that if he's actually high up in the organization, he might have been able to get a little more time than you to right. put those miles on. Yeah. Right. I think I do recall seeing that photo now. It's not often these days, but you're going to see two in the same place, uh, right? You know, in the wild, in, in, a, in a non-dealer lot sort of place. Right, right. It was a Godwana or however you pronounce that, Godwana stone, the brown color. Oh, uh, yours is in is in a, is in the brown. No, his was. Mine is mine is originally the white, Fuji white, but then I added that wrap, that metallic blue, or excuse me, uh, flat blue wrap on the bottom half. Cool. I really nice. wanted a hint for your guys if they want one. I really wanted to do the Tasman blue with a white roof. It was cheaper for me, at least here, for a wrap company to buy the white and then wrap it blue on the bottom because if you buy blue, it's an upcharge and then it's another upcharge to get a white roof on that. Okay. So basically the white is like a kind of a base model and then you can uh -huh. go from white there is, and do what you want. White is the cheap one. Right. And it's, I can change the color. It's, if the, it's for the corporate fleets and the people with no imagination. <laughs> also, it's a it lot is the blank canvas. Yeah. You don't get the scratches off road either on white. Oh, I'm pretty sure we can put scratches in it. Yeah, so there's a way. I'm pretty sure we can. Yeah, that sounds like yeah. a challenge. I've tried. Have you been into sand, snow, rocks? I've been sand and snow. Snow in Colorado, sand here where I live. We've got a little beach that we can go on. 
trying to think where else I've been in sand on there. Uh, we have a lot of sand in our trail rides around here, uh, a lot of clay. So it's real sandy bottom. I've, I've been in just about anything. I've, uh, in Colorado, it was snowing like crazy. When we went out there, we went all through the mountains and never had a single hiccup. So happy. Uh, you know, I got out of that last time because I was tired of paying the, the rates because we don't have right now a good shop for older Land Rovers here in town. You, you're basically paying, and I don't, I, I like our dealer. Our dealer is a great group. They're actually going to help me with the event that we're going to put on. It's just sometimes you want something, they're about an hour away. I'd rather have a little local shop to be able to take care of older cars like that than have to drive and all that. Back, I'm sure, out of warranty. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, does your foot actually stay dry when you're in rain and in, in the uh, in snow? In the new Defender? Yeah. I have had no, <laughs> my foot is, oh, you're talking about the old ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those of us, who, those of us who have driven a uh, kind of a traditional defender. Uh, yeah, especially you know. a right hand drive where you have no choice, but to oh. keep your right foot right next to the door. Yep. Lord have mercy. I had a 110. Uh, I can't remember what year, 1985 or 86. I had a 110 and boy, oh boy, that was a mess. <laughs> 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 I I had to line my garage with, with cardboard. It was just a mess. I, I thought I'd love it, but it drove me nuts. So, so how do you compare the two then? So, so it sounds like you do have a, a traditional Defender experience. Yeah. Um, I would love to have another one. I, I'm, I'm to the point where I'd lo- really like to have a series convertible. I don't have a garage right now or a soft top, I should say. I would, I, I don't know if I go back with an old Defender. You know, there was so much, hatred for the new one because of its looks mainly i would assume when the old one disappeared and from having both i really really like the new one it's so <laughs> much more comfortable <laughs> so yes. much nicer yes. Yes. It's, <laughs> but it's still so capable off-road I, right. I don't know what you're going to get into unless you have a super heavily modified old defender that the new one can't do as well and also you can drive 70 miles an hour with, you know, one finger on the wheel. Right. And feel okay and not have a wet foot uh, or, <laughs> or have a cold air, have to wear driving gloves to keep the cold air off your hands while your hand is on the steering wheel because you can't move it. Yeah. You're bringing back memories. I just, I, I see the rust falling off of it every time I shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't right. get me wrong. I loved it. I, I'm a so sucker. you had an unrestored original Defender. Then. I had an unrestored okay. original Defender. Yeah, that's a different different beast of its own. Yeah. Yes. it. Somebody at one point had put a four liter engine in it. It was a left-hand drive, automatic transmission, and it was, you know, oh. set up. Well, but it's still, it was still kilometers per hour on the, on the gauge. It was just kind of a, uh, Frankenstein of an old defender. And, um, it was a little bit more than I wanted to deal with at the time. Well, they are a lifestyle choice. Yeah. <laughs> not again, not knocking them. I'd love to have another one. I, I, every day I look at, you know, I've obviously got the sickness every day. I look on Facebook marketplace or eBay just to see what's out there. Bring it, you know, all the other places. They're out there. I'll end up with one. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So tell us more about this uh, Defender that you had. Uh, so it's a left-hand drive. It was uh, in the 80s. Did you, uh, how long did you have it? Oh, somewhere around a year-ish. I started to do some work to it. It was original interior when I bought it. So I had the interior taken out. I took it all out. I do all, most of it, as much as I can myself. I took the interior out, uh, brought it to a place to have some Linex put on the inside. I wanted to try that. I've had good luck. I do a lot of uh, work with boats around here as well. And I had an aluminum boat that I put Linex in that worked out really well. Made it nicer, had the seats recovered, you know, did whatever I could to spruce it up a little bit and enjoyed it. But um, it wasn't very fun without air conditioning in Florida, uh, especially in the summer. And doing any kind of longer drive just drove me crazy. I ended up losing the love for it and sold it to somebody who I'm sure had their fun with it too. Mm-hmm. So what else have you had? So I think that I'm counting four so far, if I'm keeping oh, track gosh. here. I started, I've had a 2006, 2009, 2010, and 2011. No, I'm sorry. 2006, 2008, 2010, 2011, L322. So that's four. I had a 2006 Range Rover Sport 5. 
I had that old defender six. The new defender is seven. 405 is eight and the P38 is nine. Okay. And, and what is the current count? Right now I'm at, I have three. I okay. have the new defender, the 405 and the P38. All right. The P38 is my fun. I've, I've done as much as I can to the new defender and the P38 is my, my fun one now to play with. That's your beater? That's my beater. It was actually <laughs> right when I shipped my, my defender out to Arizona, this one popped up in the Gulf Coast Land River Club Facebook page and the guy that owned it used to work at the dealership and he was literally five minutes down the road from me. Had no idea he was here. And cheap, you know, it's already modified. It's got a winch mount and all that business lifted going coils now and oh, it's, castrated yeah. the suspension. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, I would like to see it, but I think that that one probably had too many issues. It's a 98 model and it's just hmm. it's a lot less for me to worry about right now. I have two with air that I can worry about. Yeah, I mean, I like the I like the air suspension in that truck, but yeah, the, w- keeping that suspension system working properly is kind of a pain in the butt. They they put it together in a rather fiddly sort of way. Keeping the engine or the battery charge seems to be a little bit tricky. I don't know if I want to do much more than that right now. <laughs> yeah, you, you've got a computer or two that are staying awake. Probably is is the issue. Yeah, it, the, the yeah, P38s well, are notorious for that. Not everything going to sleep when it should and running the battery down. Well, we had a knock on it uh, when we were off roading on Sunday, and it bottomed out pretty good. So I'm sure it jostled something around. Yeah. But so I put a, just today, a little solar panel on the roof that I try to keep that battery going during the day. Uh-huh. So you, you say you have sun there. Yeah, we do have sun. <laughs> Some, well, not lately, but this week we're back at it. We had that, we had that winter storm come through here too, and I did not like it. I think we've had sun for the first time in about a month and a half here in the oh. southwestern Pennsylvania. Yeah, wow. it was a, so it was a long winter. Uh, I'm not going to rub it in that over here. <laughs> but I did take the but I, but I did take the defender out in the snow, and it was amazing because it was just at yeah. the end of the storm. You know, the storm was long over, but a lot of snow. And my uh, it was warm enough in the cabin, which was good. Yeah, was yeah, warm, yeah. But, you can keep that going. Yes, but I have uh, learned that I have a piece of cardboard that I keep in the center console that I use in the winter time that I put uh, behind the driver vent to keep cold air from coming into the, ca- well, to <laughs> redirect it off my hand. Uh, so that's my, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> what's the cardboard for? It's in critical. It's in very important. It's for the winter time. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that the new defender is doing that. So. Uh, well, the, the new defender doesn't have scuttle vents for one thing. Yeah. See, there you go. See, I know it's, it's, it needs it's, the it's an <laughs> Of course, they got rid of that on the old defenders too. In in what oh seven, yeah, seven or nine, that. somewhere in oh, there. Yeah, somewhere in there, yeah, the the Puma. Yeah, when they put the uh, when they put air conditioning or or the well, the NAS didn't have it either. Oh, that's right. I think the NAS. You're right. I think they did not. Nope, the NAS one tens did not have scuttle vents. Did they have air conditioning? Uh, yes, they did. That, that would be, that's probably the, that's probably what happened then. And then they probably made it permanent down the road. So do you have a non Rover? That's maybe your daily driver since we, uh, you've got, no. uh, when does he have time to drive a daily driver? He's putting 12 grand on that, that defender in five months. No, he has no time to be in anything else. I got tired. My wife had a, uh, my wife had a Yukon and I got tired of her driving that boring old car around. So mm-hmm. that's why we got, uh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't tell her that the, the one I got was a, a lemon buyback that L405 <laughs> because she was all worried yeah. about it not working. So <laughs> now she's driving that one. Some nice. things are better left unsaid. Yeah, exactly. We will just keep that under the down low. Right. I know she won't be listening. There you go. Good, good. It'll work out. It'll work out. In the past, have you gone to other events? Have you been like, have you been to the, you know, the birthday party or tomorrow, or sounds like you've gone to the West coast, any, uh, off-roading no, in those areas? The only events, the Land Rover events I've been to have been the ones that are typically down here. And I've gone to the Land River experiences, uh, been to Vermont and now Biltmore twice. I enjoy doing those every now and then just to drive something different, see what they do in different areas. I'd love to do the one in California. Um, I'm sure when all this, uh, what's going on ends at some point, uh, because I don't think California would be too welcoming. uh, (laughs) Right. Uh, They're probably not even doing it. Who knows? I haven't even looked. Uh, You need to get up to Montreal and need to go to the, uh, 
the, the one that's uh, north of Montreal in, in Quebec. I'd love to. I'd yeah, love to I've not been to any of them, but that that I think the Montreal one would be would be cool. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And well, should, this was should go another time. Yeah, I like driving theirs, but I decided to take mine and uh, see what it could do. I, I had not been off road in it at that point, so that's why I wanted to take my new Defender and see exactly with a controlled environment with a Land Rover instructor tell me what this thing can do, how I can do it. And it was very informative. Well, that's good to hear. Great that's opportunity. Good. Yeah. 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 So Does, what, what are they running for their vehicles now? Are they running the discos or? So we went, uh, we had two vehicles because of COVID. He wouldn't, he wasn't going to ride in the car with me. We communicated with radios. He was in actually a, a NAS 90. And uh, he was ahead of me. I would follow him around in that. So whatever the 90 could do, I can do. They also have a new discovery. On would hope. What's that? I said one would hope you can keep up with a, a NAS yeah. 90. They had 25 a, years old. Right. They had a uh, new discovery there. They had, I saw a new uh, L405. I saw a new Defender. And I think that's it. I think they cut out the, I think he told me they cut out using the Evoke and the Discovery Sport just because they didn't have enough people doing the events right now. They have any uh, Range Rover Sports? I don't remember seeing one. Probably I'm sure they do. I saw the other Defender roving around out there when we were doing our course. It's uh, it's always fun to see. At that point, I mean, I think that up until that point, I had probably only seen maybe 10 maximum of all these travels. That was the last big trip I did was to the uh, to Asheville. And I, I have not seen probably since then maybe 15 on the road. And all over from Colorado to Key West to Asheville. Ooh. Interesting. I know they're selling them, but I just don't see them. That's about 15 more than I've seen on the road. <laughs> My friend sells, uh, sends me pictures. He lives in kind of a hoity-toity area called Fairhope, Alabama, and he sends me a picture every time he sees a girl driving one and says it's a girl car. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, uh, that, That's, I think, maybe the first time I've heard hoity-toity in Alabama in the same sentence. Oh, let me tell you, we got that's it. Impressive. Man. I live right on the state line here in Pensacola and uh, they've got it too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen three or four new defenders in the Pittsburgh area. And oh, one, the last one, I actually, uh, this was, I just, I had to take a drive and get out of the house. It was a weekend oh. and I just had to get out. And, I just, and it was a decent day. It was on a weekend and I drove the, drove my defender and I went into downtown Pittsburgh and I, I'm just at stoplight and I look ahead and I go, there's a new defender on the side of the road that's parked there and someone's getting, getting into it. I cruise up next to it and um, open the driver's door because, because you know, winding the window down is not going to work. No, uh, <laughs> it's, it, it will, it'll work. It just takes too much effort. Open up the door and, I, and a guy puts his window down. And I go, Hey, nice truck. I said, you know, this is defender too. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> like i was excited he was like okay what are you some 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 wacko was you know pulled up next to me so he's a first time rover owner obviously i suspect i didn't there, there wasn't much conversation beyond me saying hey nice truck and that's a you know and this is a defender too and um, hey what i've learned is I've, so you get the the standard range rover owner response then basically Yes. Yes. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yes. I, I've quit waving at the Range Rovers. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a waste of time. It is. Yeah. It is. And I've had more Range Rovers than Land Rovers, you know, older ones, uh, you know, years past when they were new and it's still, I, nobody knows what they are. It's all basically my wife driving around and one, not knowing what in the world she's driving. Well, she's only driving it because you told her to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She, not I mean, because she wants to. Yeah, she loves the vehicle. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a, it's one of those uh, what's the color? Byron blue with the navy blue interior. Ooh, gorgeous. That's different. Mm -hmm. That's different. Yeah, and uh, she loves that part of it. So you're going to get her to go to the event so she can get some exposure. Oh, I'm I've been begging her to come do a off road drive. I think I'll get her to the event. I'll get the car there. She'll hang out and look at the other cars. I don't know if I'll get her off the road. Yeah, but that's all right. If she can see a few others, maybe she'll start to understand. She's starting to understand my obsession at this point. She's <laughs> like, I didn't know this about you. I said, well, you came into my life whenever I was outside of my Land Rover obsession, uh, but I'm back now. I see. Ah. How, how long was your hiatus? Two or three years. Oh, that's not too bad then. Okay. Yeah, not too bad. It yeah. was, uh, I don't know what in the world came over me. What, was there something else in the meantime? Like, did you like Toyota no. or... Porsche or something? Boring old F-250. Okay. Nothing crazy. Yeah. I've spent more of my time dealing with, I 
I was in the boating business at that point, and I spent more of my time playing with boats and redoing boats. And uh, that's what it's more. I, I take the same approach to Land Rovers as I do with boats. It's some, you know, it's something you just got to throw money into, <laughs> and it's going to be something's going to break, something's going to go wrong, and just be prepared to right. be on the side of the road somewhere. Right. And, uh, right. It's it's the same philosophy. You got to just throw money at it to fix it. Right. Make sure you have your your cell phone works, and you have your friends, <laughs> and you have AAA, and exactly. You know, tri- AAA has those different levels of service. They have, you know, the plus and the premium and all that. I think they need to have a AAA British <laughs> as another level of service. <laughs> I agree 100%. That would make me feel a lot better. Well, I, they kind of sort of do. There is the uh, elite level, which is you get a one-time during a, during the calendar year of 200-mile towing instead of the normal 100-mile towing. You know, I think that that's what, what got me out of the last one was I was driving that, that L322. That was another pretty one. It was blue with the Navy blue interior. And I haven't seen many of those. When I saw it on eBay, I quickly ran and got it. You but like your blue, driving, don't you? I love the blues. Uh, I was driving down the side of the road and the fuel pump just decided to quit working and stranded. And I was driving behind it. And then the dealer also told me it needed the timing chain. So I said, oh, my goodness, I think I've got, I've got to get a regular car for a minute and take a break. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's what we'd call midlife crisis. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure somebody's enjoying it now after all the work we put into it. But uh, no, I'm back, baby. I'm, I'm full in. I've thrown all my cards in. That's what happens. You, you really never let it go. It's uh, no, no, no. Cause there's, there's a passion there and I don't think the passion goes away. I agree with you. There's not many vehicles that have that kind of passion to them. Well, you certainly have a passion for Land Rovers and I guess that explains the Pensa Rover rally. And uh, how did it start? Like, I, I know you mentioned it when we started this out that there's nothing else going on, but have you been thinking this idea for a while and this, this is a good opportunity? You know, it, you would think that this is something you stew on for a while, but I'm a very spur of the moment type of guy. And <laughs> I, 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 mean, <laughs> I was very tired of not having these get togethers. And so I said, well, why don't I do one? Nobody seemed to be, you know, thinking of an event for all of us to get together. So I said, well, I'll do it. And I've been enjoying, I've done some, since I've gotten this defender again, I've been doing some rides with other guys in the Land Rover club and I've been having such a great time doing it that I, it's it's almost like herding cats to get some of these guys together and do it. So I figured it was going to take a bigger event, you know, some organization and rather than let's all get together next week. I've given it a couple of months notice and I've got some great uh, partners in this that are very interested in what we're doing. They're not necessarily Land Rover people, but they know of older Land Rovers and they think it's cool and it'll bring them business. So why not? Let's give it a shot. And where is it taking place exactly? So we're going to do an off-road ride uh, that morning in a state park. Uh, and then what I plan to do is get everybody together at Perfect Plain Brewing Company, downtown Pensacola. It's a brewery. Uh, they also have a craft uh, cocktail bar. They have a bunch of food available there through their own food truck. It's just a really cool uh, gathering spot downtown. And the best part is there's a lot of parking nearby. Um, A lot of the other bars downtown don't really have a lot of parking. They don't have the facility size. They don't have the food in one place. And these people have really gone above and beyond in in helping us and wanting to participate with us. So I'm I'm really happy with that. So, and the off-roading is a takes place, I guess you said the morning before the, the gathering and the gatherings in the afternoon at the brewery. I figured people would want to see a dirty land river. They don't want to see clean ones. No, of course not. You, well, I, why would you even wash it? Exactly. I, I You're gonna get, if the public's going to come, they need to see that they can get dirty and have some fun. Right. Washing avoids the warranty. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, downtowns on a Saturday are a very busy time and I, I would like to get a little bit more attention for land rovers. We don't, our near our dealer and they have expressed interest in coming to help is an hour away in Mobile, Alabama. And I would like to, uh, I, I don't know them, uh, you know, personally, besides me bringing my cars to get service there, but I would like to help them. I would like to see more land rovers around. I'd like to see the love, you know, spread in this part of the world and uh, you know, just bring awareness to it. There's, we have a lot of, 
Toyotas around here. The FJ is very popular. The Forerunners are very popular, especially with the, the, I don't know what it is with the Navy guys. We've got a huge Navy base nearby and they all drive those. I noticed that Tacomas to all the Toyotas. So let's bring some Land Rovers around here. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's spread, spread the awareness. That's right. That's right. The off-roading, what kind of uh, off-roading will that be? What's the terrain like and what level of experience? There's a little bit of everything in there. You've got a, a, some stream crossings. You have some technical climbs. You have some mud pits. You have anything and everything you'd want to put through it. I, I went with that fellow I bought the P38 from, and you, you know he's happy with this car if he'll sell it and then go off-road with you in his other P38 and uh, believe it'll work. That's, so that's we, a good, That is a good sign. That is a good exactly. sign. Exactly. Yeah. We did a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of everything. We drove around there. I think we did almost 50 miles on Sunday through these trails and saw just about everything that you can in there. I'm really impressed with some areas. There's some good technical climbs. There are some things that I was a little nervous going into, but he went and did it on the EAS uh, P38 stock EAS P38 in front of me. And it's things that, you know, it's, it's up there in the, in the scary, you know, pucker factor moments of, of driving off road. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm happy with uh, what I saw. I'm going to go do a few more drives just to make sure that we make a course. Scouting, before. scouting. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. That, that, all the, all the, all the clubs do that for their, for their different events, you know, the winter romp and the and Mar, they do scouting activities. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Not because they want to, but because they have to. That's yes. Right. That's right. <laughs> We have some other areas around here that are, are really interesting as well, but uh, mainly Eglin Air Force Base. You can drive around in there, and they've got some really cool uh, you know, dead helicopters or dead uh, F-4 Phantoms back there. But the I don't think it's meant for a group uh, gathering because you have to watch these videos beforehand and sign off that you've gotten the permit. And they say one of the funnier parts is if you come across an unexploded ordinance, you know, I like to joke around, they say, don't hit it with a hammer, but it, you know, you have to tell you people. Think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't yeah, use a chainsaw instead. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't mess with bombs. So I'm like, yeah. well, we probably shouldn't go over there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a <laughs> little extra technical challenge. That's a little different kind of off-roading there. Right. When you right. have to worry about unexploded ordnance. So, so no rock crawling over the unexploded bombs. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I highly don't recommend that. Especially right. since I'm in the insurance business, please don't do that. No. So in that case, would would it be better to put the, you're supposed to put the wheel on the obstacle to lift your your differential up over the obstacle, or would it be better in this case to try to straddle it so that the you might miss it altogether? I'm wondering what the uh, the right line is to take. I think the preferred line is one that bypasses that particular obstacle. Yeah, I didn't see any bombs, and I, I'm glad I didn't. I'm not even sure what, well, a, they, what would have done. They don't necessarily bomb have a sign on them saying bomb. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Watch well, the video. The, the, training ones, video. the ones that Wiley Coyote orders from the Acme company. <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah. Exactly. So you're not off-roading in the, with the unexploded ordinance. You're off-roading yeah. at a different location. No, no bombs okay. that are, at least we are aware of. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. It's a state park. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how many people will get. I hope that we have a few, you know, the last ones that I've gone through was uh, the rallies were a little, uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, wasn't a lot of terrain difference. And it was just kind of a lot of driving in the woods and right. uh, pine needle paths, but you get a chance to do a little bit more in this. Right. Are each person's satisfaction or, or level of comfort. Do people need to, to pre-register? Is there a cost? No, there's no cost to any of this. Uh, if you would like to join in, I'm going to put information on the ride in a pub, or excuse me, on a private, the Gulf Coast Land River group uh, group on Facebook, because I don't want to attract a lot of attention from the non Land River guys. You know, you, you don't want to ruin a good thing and have uh, have somebody come and ruin the party for you uh, because they don't like it. So if you're interested in doing the ride. Join the Gulf Coast Land River Group on Facebook. The public event, uh, Pensa Rover Rally, will be, excuse me, I should probably enunciate that a little bit better. It is hard to say. Pensa Rover Rally will be, uh, .com, will have the information on what we'll do uh, that day with the uh, show downtown, uh, parking around. People can come visit, see the cars, see whatever you want. And then if we end up spilling into a second day, like I mentioned with the mullet toss, uh, we'll put that on there as well. And that's Pensa, P-E-N-S-A, roverrally.com. That will take you right to the Facebook page. Correct. 
And if you're uh, from Pennsylvania, uh, it is not two ends. It's just one end. <laughs> so I, Good point. I, I'm like, I couldn't get to the website. And I'm like, well, oh, I have two ends in there because it's natural to type in P-E-N-N. Well, for you, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, for me, it's, ooh, that's different. Yeah, exactly. Well, having grown up here, so, you know, it's always So P-E-N-N. again, the, the date is April 24th? April 24th. We're going to get together from one. Now, is that, a, is that a Saturday? It is a Saturday. Okay. We have a lot of guys in our group, uh, the, the Gulf Coast group, that are are busy on Sundays doing the devotionals, and uh, I respect that. So we try to stick with a, a Saturday. And if we end up going to throw mullet on the beach on Sunday, they don't have to participate in that. So you're saying right. the mullet throwing is optional. Yes, mullet throwing the day after <laughs> is optional. And also, I should mention we are going to a brewery, but they also have plenty of non-alcoholic drinks. And, uh, for the guys that don't want to participate, it's a great place to eat as well. It's family friendly. Um, so they'll be able to come see the cars parked on the street and, and entertain themselves that way. It's worth a drive downtown anyway. Any chance we can get a flyover of the blue angels? Well, uh, you know, I do live right next to the Navy base. I'll see what I can do. I was kind of hoping they'd interrupt our recording here. <laughs> They are in California right now. They come back in March. So there could be a chance that mm. fall over. Oh, okay. So th- are the Blue Angels seasonal and where they are stationed? They are home based here in Pensacola and they're here from March to usually about December. But then they do their training in California at Miramar during uh, the winter months. Sure, they do. I don't know why, but uh, maybe Top Gun. Who knows? Uh, well, you maybe, and I think that, you know, it's just, it, it's a straight shot to the Pacific to, yeah. they, uh, of course you've got the Gulf, but I think there's more stuff happening in the Gulf. The Pacific's more wide open in case something goes wrong. There's less likely. Yeah. I don't know why, but, um, I can't wait for him to come back. I miss the noise. Usually if there's a flyover, we would have to stop the recording. It's, uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I, you know, well, when I was in college in California, I lived about two miles from the end of the runway and at the airport and the, and the Air National Guard had a had a squadron of F-4s and F-4 is like the loudest oh, plane they ever flew and and antiquated even in the 80s. And, and just like the world had to stop for about 10 minutes when they started taking off. I wish I lived here when the Blue Angels were F-4s. I'll bet that was a uh, something to experience, like you say. Six of them flying overhead. Was as certain. long as you weren't paying for the windows on your house. <laughs> yeah, no joke. Well, Alec, thanks very much for coming on to the podcast and telling us about the Pensa Rover Rally. Do you expect this will be a, an annual thing or is this, do you think maybe it's still a one-timer? I hope it's an annual event. Uh, if we get it, a good amount of people, I've just put it live today on Facebook and I've already have almost 20, I believe, uh, that are expressing interest in it. If uh, I think it would be a good time. I think people were missing the get togethers and, and having some camaraderie there with the vehicles. There was a British car show in Fairhope, the, the hoity toity area of Alabama earlier. Uh, I think I'm in, sorry. I still have a hard time with yeah. that. That's, that's funny. <laughs> it was in October and they had a good showing of the Land Rover guys there. So I'm hoping that we can uh, get that same sort of enthusiasm. I think they had about 10 to 12 there. So I hope that they all come. Well, Alex, thanks for coming onto the program and telling us about the Pensa Rover Rally on behalf of the entire Land Rover community. If I can do that, thank you for putting on a rally. Uh, thank you for your show. I appreciate the entertainment that it provides on my long drives. And I, I should also thank you personally for supporting the show. That's how I kind of got introduced to you. So uh, thanks very oh, much for, for, your, for your support of the show. Support everything that I enjoy because I want other people to enjoy it too. And nice to hear about your uh, new Defender uh experience. That's cool. I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to buy one. <laughs> do you think, do you think the V6 would be better or the, uh, the, the fellow that I met in the keys, uh, told me drive a V6 or drive the six cylinder one and you will be converted for life. So I have not yet. I don't want to have to immediately sell mine and go find one because they're hard to find right now. And on that note, thanks very much again, Alex. Thank you, John. This has been show number 95. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. I want to thank Harold and Morgan for joining us on the show today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for having me as always. And thanks for Dixon thinking about joining us. He probably had other things to do. Hopefully he'll be back next month. He was bit busy doing important things for someone. 
somewhere. I think he's I think he's at the border just waiting for it to like open up so he can get across. He's just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> open, please, open, please open, let me open, in. open, let me open. In. And thanks to our guest this month, Alex Bro, for talking about the Pensa Rover Rally, which will take place on April 24th. If you go, let us know. Let us know how it went. And don't forget the shout out to the one true packs for his continued production support. I realize uh, listeners probably don't know what he does, uh, but he does uh, make the show sound better and uh, he's usually busy doing things, but uh, we appreciate his helping out keeping the show going. And that's an important job trying to make us sound better. It's certainly not easy. He's a valued member of the team. We're part of the four by four radio network. And I invite you to check out all the other four by four related shows at four X four radio network.com. Visit our website, centersteer.com to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's podcast, including Katie's song about called overland breakdown. If you're listening to the podcast on our website, download a podcast app and subscribe so you have the podcast automatically delivered to you when it's available. We post a new podcast at the end of every month. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, and voicemail. And you can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer. You can buy us a t-shirt, sticker, or buy us a tea. Click on store on the menu of our webpage for more details. Or you can send us some brown water. Just don't tell us where it came from. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Thank you for listening. We... (laughs) We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Click on voicemail on the website to let us know. The next voicemail will receive a Center Steer t-shirt. It's a thank you for listening to the end of the show. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. This episode of the Center Steer podcast has been brought to you by Turbo Boost. That's right, folks. When you hear that sound, you know that important things are getting done. But if you don't hear that, then you're just not being as productive as you could be. So head on down to your local specialist and you tell them you want your truck to go. You can thank me later. And you may now resume your important things. So, so no rock crawling over the unexploded bombs.